Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Jacob, also welcome, Jacob. Glad you're here. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we're, um, we're going to be having these studies on Wednesdays and hope you can all come uh, and join us. Uh, we, we can join quite a few people, so please try to make it. Bring your Bibles, etc. Today, uh, Jacob's going to be teaching uh, an introduction to Colossians. Now, during the meeting, uh, I've muted all the microphones. If you have questions, please send them to David, and uh, we'll uh, at the end we'll do some some questions, and then after that, we will open the mics up and you can fellowship. Uh, hopefully, that sounds okay to you guys. And, um, well, uh, Jacob, anytime you're ready. Anytime we're ready. Let's go to the, oh, I see a scouse over there. When did you, <laughs> hey, Steve, the scouse, when did you get out of Walton? <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you thankfully and worshipfully, knowing, Lord God, that when we pray, you give us the privilege by your spirit of talking to you. But when your spirit opens your word, you talk to us. Be glorified in our midst, Lord God. Let these things be glorifying to you and upbuilding to your son's body, to your people in these last days. And Lord, if there's any listening who perhaps have not come to a saving knowledge of the truth, I pray that you will bring the conviction of sin upon them and show them the sure hope of eternal life in Jesus who saved us. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, I've been to Colossae many times. It's nothing. It's not excavated. There's a hill, something that in Israel will be called a tell, and a few bits, but there's nothing. However, it is very close to two other places. And by close, I mean walking distance. It's in walking distance to a city called Hierapolis, Hierapolis, and it's in walking distance to Laodicea. Walking distance. I mean like a couple of miles. Uh, not far at all. So we have to understand when we read this that what Paul was writing from prison in Rome towards the end of his life, he was not just writing to Colossae alone, but he was writing to a broader community of believers, which he points out later on in the epistle. It was a group of fellowships that knew each other and that considered themselves to be one, and they were all in the same area as in walking distance. Colossae being in the shadow of Laodicea. Laodicea is very well excavated. It's an incredible place to visit if you ever have the chance to go there. But Colossae, unless the tour guide on a bus or something pointed it out, you wouldn't even know it was there. You just go by it. There's absolutely nothing to see. The tour buses don't even stop there, basically, because there's nothing there to look at. It's just nothing. It's just a location on a map. Never been excavated. I don't know why. But I remember when Laodicea was not well excavated, and now it's incredibly well excavated. Perhaps somebody will eventually get a shovel and go to Colossae. One of the things I discovered in traveling to these areas of the world over the years, when I first began going there to the lands of the Bible as a fairly young believer, that when you go to these places that are well excavated, like Ephesus and Philippi and, and, and Corinth, you see how the archaeology not only bears out the historicity and accuracy of what the scriptures say, but broadens our perspective of what the scriptures say. You get to see what kind of a situation the epistle was written to in terms of its urban layout and things of that nature, things that, that, that impact the emphasis of the way that the authors were inspired to write by the Holy Spirit. There's a lot to be said for studying the scripture on site. 
But Colossae wouldn't do you much good. There's nothing you're going to see there that you can't learn from just reading books and internet articles, journal articles, and so forth. Nonetheless, we have to understand certain things about this important book and why we're studying it. You can't know where you're going unless you know where you are, and you can't know where you are unless you know where you came from. We can't know where we presently are at this time in history in the body of Christ unless we know how we got here. And unless we know how we got here, we're not going to know where we're going. So many of the challenges facing the church over the centuries, but certainly the ones facing the church today most particularly, are addressed in the core teaching of the epistle to the Colossians. We don't know. Paul may have passed through it on his third missionary journey. That's an educated guess, but nobody knows. But he'd heard about this church, and now he's in prison. Nero's going to kill him not too much further in the future, and so on. But the tone and character with which he writes, writes reflects his encouragement, even though he's in prison, because of his perspective. Now, we have to understand something. There are certain epistles that are hypostatically related. They're almost one substance, but they look at it from different angles. For instance, Romans and Galatians both deal with the same thing, essentially the purpose of the law, how it points to Christ, and how it's fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews also deals with it, but from the ritual sacrificial aspect of the Levitical priesthood and temple sacrifices, Hebrews also deals with fulfillment of the law. But in the legal aspects, the juridical aspects, it is Romans and it is Galatians. Romans is proactive. It says, look, here's the law. It points to Christ. He fulfills the law on our behalf. The law indicts us, shows us we need a savior. Here he is. Galatians deals with the same subject, only reactively. It's reacting against legalists and people called nomianists. Separate subject, I only mention it. You can't understand Romans without understanding Galatians completely, and you can't understand Galatians without understanding Romans. You have the same kind of relationship between Ephesians the epistle to the church at Ephesus, to the Ephesians, and Colossae. Ephesians deals with the church in relation to Christ. Colossians deals with Christ in relation to the church. Ephesus looks at the, the church relative to Christ, Colossians looks at Christ relative to the church. Now, he's always got to be the essence, the epicenter. We once did a teaching, it's available online, called uh, Christ the Foundation, when truth becomes a lie. When you make another, when you replace the central truth of Christ with another truth, even though it may be true, It'll become a lie. It'll lead you astray. He's always got to be the center. Well, that relates here to Colossae. Another epistle related to Colossae is, of course, Philemon. Philemon and the Epic of Onesimus. Uh, they're both about the same geographical location. So the saga of Onesimus, which means useful in Greek, the runaway slave who returns to a benevolent Christian master, uh, and becomes useful to God, that takes place in the same area. But again, these churches were connected. The people in Heropolis and the people in Laodicea and the people in Colossae, they knew each other. They all knew each other. They could speak to each other. They were not unfamiliar to each other. It was just an extended Christian community at this particular area known as Phrygia, Phrygia. Now, something would later happen in Phrygia after the apostles. The first Toronto experience, the first 
Pensacola Deception, the first Lakeland, the first counterfeit revival took place in the same area of Phrygia. They forgot what was written to them. Had they not forgotten what was written to them, the deception wouldn't have happened. That deception was known as Montanism. Montanism. Can you imagine people saying, well, there's a city where God's spirit is moving. There's a revival in this city. And we have to go to this city to get the anointing and then bring it back to our city so there'll be a revival. We have to go there and, and get the blessing and bring it back. And there was these women prophesying these things falsely. And people were enthralled with this. And there were people who were scooped up in it, absorbed into it, who you never would have thought would have went with it, that would have seen through it. Among them, the church father, Tertullian, who was a lawyer who presented a legal defense on behalf of the persecuted church to the Roman government. There were people who got caught up in it that you never would have thought would have believed it. This all comes from Phrygia, Phrygia, where Colossae is. This was Montanism. It was the first Toronto experience. And it was the same as what you see today. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. People were going there thinking they're going to get the blessing and bring it back, but they brought no revival. The whole emphasis was the apostles did miracles and signs and wonders, and God wants to do that again, but we have to go to this place to get it because this is where it's happening, and it was out of order. It was people prophesying in the flesh. It was women without their head covered, not as, as in a veil or a hat, but not operating under the protective authority of male leadership. It was just out of God's order. It was the first major false revival that encompassed most of the known world. It had international ramifications, but it came from this same area. Now, God is a God of foreknowledge, obviously. Past, present, and future are the same to him. Perhaps it was <laughs> with that consideration, in part, that God inspired Paul to write these things to believers in Phrygia. But let's understand more about it. Colossae, uh, east of Ephesus, not a place that had the emphasis in Scripture or in church history as its neighbor Laodicea, or Ephesus, to which there's two epistles, the epistle of Paul, and the epistle of Jesus in Revelation chapter 2. But it's important. It's crucial to that area. Why wasn't the epistle sent to Laodicea? Well, later there would be, by Jesus. But it goes to Colossae first. Remember, it is the epicentricity of Christ as the focus relating to the church. That's the focus. When Christ is not central, you're going to have a problem. You will always have a problem uh, when Christ is not central. One of the many things that accounts for the failure of the charismatic movement to bring authentic revival, by and large, was they were putting the Holy Spirit and experience as the central focus, of course, instead of the person of Christ. Again, I don't want to reteach uh, Christ the foundation when truth becomes a lie, but it relates very much to what happened in Colossae. Now, most of the problems facing the church historically, but most of the problems, including spiritual seductions facing the church today, stem from what Colossae was warned about. It basically comes down to this. The philosophies of the world eclipsing Christ, obscuring the essential truths of the gospel and the New Testament, and infiltrating the church. 
the philosophies of the world getting into the church. So Jesus becomes phased out of the equation. He's no longer the central factor. He becomes peripheral, even though they may use his name and things of this nature. This is what Colossians is very much talking about. Now, if we were to apply this historically, well, let's go back to the time of Constantine the Great, Augustine of Hippo, and those who influenced him, such as Ambrose of Milan and uh, Cyprian of Carthage. Once that happened, and Christianity was turned into Christendom as the religion of the empire, something that was perpetrated for political purposes more than anything else. The Roman Empire was fragmenting between the Greek-speaking East and the Latin-speaking West. Constantine moves his capital to Istanbul, to Constantinople from Rome, putting the center of power in the East to try to hold the East and the West together to stop the East from drifting away. And he saw Christianity as a way to unite the East and West because there were large numbers of believers in both the Latin West and the Greek East. That's what it basically came to. There was a political agenda in this. And when that happened, the door was open. Platonic philosophy, the philosophies of Plato, some of which were compatible or not contradictory to the New Testament, but some that were quite different, got into the church and people began to turn Christianity from a faith, from a theology, into a philosophy. Christianity began to go from a theology to a philosophy. These things have happened over the centuries. In the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas was an Aristotelian. He followed Aristotle, not Plato. He Aristotelianized Christianity much the way that Rambam, Maimonides, Aristotelianized Judaism, and the same thing happened first of all in Islam. The philosophy of the world that predominated at the time got into the church. Now, as we've explained before on various other teachings, the philosophies of the world that predominate at any point in history are always driven by the zeitgeist, by the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age drives the philosophy and the worldview of people. And there are different reasons and all kinds of considerations as to why things evolve and develop the way they do. But the zeitgeist, there's always a spirit on back of it. And the zeitgeist is the spirit of the age. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the ages. <laughs> he transcends any one age. The fundamental truths of scripture doctrinally do not mutate. The philosophies of the world mutate. So what happens is people begin to misread scripture in light of the spirit of the age and in light of the philosophy of the age. This always happens and Jesus is pushed to the side. We can go on. In the 19th century, with the birth of liberal Protestantism, for instance, out of Tübingen, Germany, in these places, and these pseudo theologians who were basically 19th century German rationalists, like Rudolf Bultmann and, and people like this. Um, liberal Protestantism, well, that was the spirit of the age. 19th century German rationalism, after Kant and Nietzsche and these people, these philosophers people began to reinterpret Christianity in light of the spirit of the age. Today, in our time, well, the spirit of the age was consumerism. And so you have the word faith prosperity preachers were doing the same thing, essentially. You know, it's consumerism. 
you show one TV commercial after another on some of these stations that have no programming, and they market one product after another. Call now, give us your Visa card, and this can be yours. Boom, boom, boom. It becomes a basis of just name it and claim it. I just bought an electric mixer. Despite COVID, I, I didn't want to buy anything from China because they're persecuting Christians and so on. So I went online and I found a, a British company that sells American kitchen products, and I bought a mixer. I ordered it yesterday. It was here today, instant. Well, okay. That's pure economics. That's pure development of, of, of a society, but it leads to a consumerist worldview. And this gets into the church. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. Kenny, Benny, and Joyce, as you've heard me say. Now, these things have roots in other things that have their origins in what Colossians warns about particularly E.W. Kenyon and William Branham and people like this, more about that as we go along. But these problems come from what Colossae warns about. We begin to read the scripture, redefine Christianity in light of a worldview. What we also have, as we know, and we've talked about it many times, and I don't want to dwell on things I've said on other recordings or in my books, I mentioned it in passing because it's necessary, is Eastern religion invading the West for the third time. The first time that happened was with the post-Nicene church fathers. The second time it happened was, of course, with the Crusades when they brought the influences in the spice trade. They brought the influences of Hinduism and, and Islam and Byzantine Christendom back into Western Europe. That was the second time. The whole thing with the rosary beads, you know, what's Vishnu? The Hindus did that. And now this is the third time. This is the third time Eastern religion is invading the Western church. This is the hyper-charismatic lunacy, the Kundalini Yoga, manifested as the Toronto experience. This is what you see today with the new apostolic reformation. That's where these things come from. Well, it's the spirit of the age. You see people taking yoga classes all over the Western world, all over they're using yoga. Well, Eastern religion has invaded Western culture, Western civilization. It is the philosophy of the age. Instead of having a traditional chaplain pray at an opening session of the American Congress or Parliament, sometimes they'll bring in a guru. <laughs> and, and they're telling people to do these these transcendental meditation type things, which if you really want to understand transcendental medication, talk to Christians from India who were saved out of it. We have a number of them in England. And it's an, you talk to them, it's an eye-opener. I mean, these are like pastors who were born in India who were saved from Hindu families. It's a real eye-opener when you talk to them. But this is what happens. The philosophy of the world infiltrates the church. How does that happen? And what do you do about it? The first thing we have to understand from Colossians is it happens from taking our eyes off of Jesus and putting it on something or someone else. I've known a few pastors. One was in, now he's in England. He had to leave because of the Harare, formerly Salisbury in, in uh, Zimbabwe. He was into the Toronto thing initially, but the Holy Spirit showed him this is wrong. He had his eyes on Jesus. A believer may become captivated with a trend, not knowing initially it's simply the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, not knowing it's the philosophy of the world, but they become taken in by it because it's what's happening in the popular Christian culture, and they get taken in by it. 
But if their focus is on their personal relationship with Jesus, he will show them this is wrong. We can understand how and why even sincere, well-intentioned believers, innocent in terms of their aims, are taken in by wrong things. We can understand that. But if their relationship with Jesus is right, their personal relationship with him, their walk with him, their communion with him, their prayer life with him, if the relationship with him is right, his sheep will always hear his voice. Get away from that stuff. Now, there is a need to highlight these errors and point out what they are and point people back to Scripture. That's true. That's true. But the fundamental essential issue is Christ. If the sheep take their eyes off the shepherd and begin listening to another voice, they're going to get into trouble. Now, Colossians is not primarily about correcting that. It is rather about preventing it from happening to begin with. These things that you see happening, when the philosophies of the world, when the zeitgeist get into the church, they don't need to happen. Colossians is written, so it won't happen. But one thing for sure, Jesus is the scripture incarnate, and the scripture is Jesus in print. When you take your eyes off the word, you take your eyes off of him. And when you take your eyes off of him, you take your eyes off the word. And you hear another voice. You see these things happening today. I've met people who were musicians in Australia who came up to me, and they were leading musicians in Hillsong, and they left it. And they told me what it really was. It was entertainment. It was a business. The doctrine was all crazy. They, they told me. And they, they listened to tapes by Philip Powell and myself and other people, and they, their relationship with Jesus showed them it's Jacob Prash didn't show them it's wrong. I can't show you anything. <laughs> I can't show you anything. Jesus will show you. Now, I can tell you, but I can't show you. <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit can do that. So let's look a bit further at some of these things. In chapter 1, verse 5, I just read the Greek today. Reviewed the, I read this chapter in, in Greek today. Uh, I like, you know, I'll talk to you in English, but before I do a presentation, I like to read, read the originals, original languages. And in verse 5, it, it jumped out at me, the word epignosos. When it says we should increase the knowledge, it's epignosos. Epi is what, like epicentric, okay? Epicentric, <laughs> okay? Not peri, epi. <laughs> Colossians contrasts epinasos, a Christ-centered knowledge, to nasos, a knowledge. There is a difference between a Christ-centered knowledge knowledge, where he is epicentric and just ordinary nasos, knowledge. Knowledge in and of itself achieves nothing. In and of itself, it achieves nothing of ultimate spiritual value. We have to understand the difference between nasos and epinasos. Now, somebody who's an epignostic, a Christ-centered knowledge, he may know intellectually the things that a Gnostic knows, <laughs> but, 
but he knows much more because he knows Christ. He can see through those things. He can understand those things. Now there is perinastos, perinastos that's not in the text, to know about something. There are unsaved people who can read the gospel, who can be perinastics. They can tell you the stories of Jesus. and the, I've, seen, I've seen tour guides in Israel that are not even saved, and they, they can tell you this is where this happened, and this is where Jesus did that, and this is... They can tell you all about it. They can tell you a, a knowledge that's about a perinosticism. <laughs> there are unsaved people who are, are perinostic. But unfortunately, there are believers who are Gnostic. We must be epinostic, epinosos. We look at everything else, all of our knowledge, from the perspective of Christ and Christ alone. Now, you can know what these people know. There is a value in that, in evangelism and apologetics. Moses was educated in the wisdom of Pharaoh before he was educated in the wisdom of God. That is true. We ought to know what unsaved people know and what they think. How are you going to evangelize people? You can't evangelize Jehovah's Witnesses unless you know what they believe. You can't evangelize Catholics unless you know what they believe. You can't evangelize Orthodox Jews unless you know what they believe. You can't evangelize New Agers unless you know what they believe. It's okay. Be educated in the wisdom of Pharaoh, as it were. But that's not the same as being educated in the wisdom of God. So... Colossians has as its premise almost, almost as its premise, a conflict in knowledge. Not the knowledge itself, but the source of the knowledge and its epidemiology. I'm, not epidemiology, I'm, I'm sorry. Epistemiology. I'm, I'm thinking about COVID. Ep, forgive my ignorance. It's epistemiology. There's a conflict. What is falsely called knowledge and what is the true knowledge of Christ? Okay, there's a conflict. Now, let's understand this further. The Nasos. That is a main issue that we see in Colossae. Paul essentially calls them philosophical speculations. Philosophical speculations. However, these are amplified in chapter 2 of Colossians by an emphasis on astral powers. Astral powers. Now, we know these astral powers, which do relate in part to the zeitgeist, these astral powers are principalities. Rashiot in Hebrew, arche in, in Greek, the principalities. Okay. You see a focus on a kind of hyper-spirituality that is, in fact, a pseudo-spirituality. Always remember, hyper Hyper-spirituality is pseudo-spirituality. The animals that were kosher in the Old Testament had a cleft foot. They were both natural, we were to be both natural and supernatural. Here is the problem that happened in the Greek world. Not only the Greek world, but in, in the time of the New Testament, it was this. And don't forget that our Western civilization came especially, essentially from the Greco-Roman world. Our Western civilization, West, Western intellect, or the Western perspective of intellect, rather, came from the Greco-Roman world. They were dualists. They were dualists. As I pointed out before, a Greek reading John chapter 1 
would have no problem with what it says about the Logos. The Greeks believed there was the Logos. They believed that the Logos had divine properties. They'd have no problem with God becoming a man. No problem. Jews, different subject. You'd have to argue their point with the angel of the Lord physically appear, appearing and, and wrestling with Jacob and so forth. You'd have to show them that it is a Jewish concept or a Jewish construction. It is something that has origins in the Hebrew scriptures. Islam completely rejects this. God becoming a man, Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. God has no son. Why is this? It goes back to this dualism. So a Greek reading John, and our logos in the beginning was the word. They don't agree with all that. Until, and my apologies to those who know this, I've said it various occasions. Until you get to verse 14, the logos became sarx, the word became flesh. Then they flip out. Then they can't handle it. God is impassable. He can't become human. <laughs> The spiritual is one spiritual realm is one thing, the physical is another. This goes against the scriptural Judeo-Christian worldview. There is a barrier between the eternal and the temporal. But that barrier is penetrated by Christ. He's God that became a man and then went back to the Father, sending his Holy Spirit. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit puncture, transcend that separation. Islam doesn't have that. The ancient Greeks didn't have that. Jehovah's Witnesses really don't have that. They say the resurrection was not literal and so forth, and he's not God. They don't have it. This barrier. This so-called barrier between the physical and the spiritual resulted in all kinds of philosophical rivalries in the first century, one of which you can see the rivalry in Paul's visit to Athens with the Areopagites in Acts 17, where you have the Epicureans and the Stoicists. The Stoicists were into, we only have to be spiritual, not physical. We have to get away from all this kind of material physical universe with this, and we have to escape it. Now, where else do you see that? Mystical Buddhism? Hinduism? You must transcend the physical and go into this other realm. Okay? You see it in Kabbalah, Kabbalistic Judaism. You see it in New Age astral projection. There must be a escape from the physical into the spiritual. That was never God's plan. The physical is not wrong in its design. It is broken because of the fall. Jesus came back. And he is in the process of restoring what was supposed to be. We are body, soul, and spirit. That harmony, known as achtut, or oneness, was interrupted by sin. Jesus comes to restore it. Jesus comes to restore it. In fallen man, there is a disharmony. 
Now, you see examples of it in Christians. Paul says, the things I don't want to do because of the law, I want to do. <laughs> you might love your wife or your husband, but you still might get tempted. And you might... There's a battle all the new creation. Okay, That disharmony between what you know is right and what God wants is in the process of being restored in Christ. Remember, the millennial reign of Jesus will be the way the planet was supposed to be. He restores the physical. He does not take people away from it. So you have the Stoics, these extreme aesthetics. They get into this radical separation to escape carnality, which they feel draws them down because in the Greek thinking, the physical world is the domain of lesser deities, lesser gods. The spiritual is the realm of the true God. That's the way they thought. The higher gods being Zeus and so forth in their thinking. Or the planet Jupiter with the Romans or whatever. Allah with Islam. Well, it's very easy to look at that. This is the realm of the lower gods. It's physical, but there's a higher realm, the spiritual one. We have to get into the spiritual one. And there's people who begin, just move your lips like this and say whatever comes into your head. Now, I believe in this charismatic gift of tongues. I believe there's actually a gift of tongues, and I don't believe it ended with the apostles. But <laughs> I've always been convinced most of what we hear is not real. People are drawn into things by hypnotic induction, empowered by demonic deception, trying to enter the spiritual realm through a way other than Christ, even though they hang his name on it. What they're doing is not scriptural. This idea that there's this separation can easily find its way into the church in the thinking of many Christians and always has. For instance, the world is in the power of the wicked one. See, you see, the physical world is in the hand of a lesser God. Jesus said Satan's the God of this world. We have to go to the spiritual realm because it's the higher God. We have to escape this physical fleshly thing. That's the thinking. Now, it is a pagan concept, a pagan mystical philosophy that gets into the church. But it seems to be compatible with the New Testament, doesn't it? Satan's the god of this world. This is the lesser God, he's the greater God. We have to go get out of the physical and go into the spiritual. And in the process, they abandon things like rational thought and common sense. <laughs> Where the scriptures say the contrary. In real Christianity, we have the power of sound mind. We are in the world, but not of it. The Lord wants to redeem the physical as well as the spiritual. Now, this gets worse. The junction between Eastern and Western thought after the time of Constantine becomes Alexandria, Egypt, at that time a Greek city. And Buddhist monks come all the way from India and they reach Alexandria. With Christendom, the church gets more and more worldly. So there are people who want to be more spiritual. And so they go into cloisterism. They become the desert fathers. They go out into the Sahara and they build these monasteries, thinking that they're somehow going to escape from the carnality of Satan's kingdom and the world by going into cloisterism. There's the monasteries, or well, the Buddhists invented the monasteries, not the, not the New Testament. The convents, the same thing. 
uh, this is a big subject. I'd point you to my book, uh, The Dilemma of Laodicea. We look at the development of these things uh, historically. But the Desert Fathers, well, their motives were right. We want to get away from the world. The church is becoming too much like the world. It's too carnal. We're going to go into... <laughs> The most famous of these monasteries is St. Catherine's in the Sinai. Not truly the location where the Ten Commandments was given, but they say it is by Greek Orthodox tradition. I went there. Now, I went there to see the scriptorium. They have an impressive manuscript collection of ancient Christian writings, and I wanted to see those. Okay, it was just a matter of personal academic interest. I wanted to see the scriptorium. I wanted to see the manuscripts and things like this. But they have what they said was the burning, <laughs> the burning bush of Moses. And the monk goes, come here, come here, I'll let you see it. And he opens, opens a little window, and you look out there, and there's a little stub coming out of the ground. And of course, they want a contribution. Then they take you into the crypt. I'm not making this up. These Greek Orthodox priests leave Greece or, or Cyprus, mainly Greece, and they come to this monastery in the middle of the desert, and they never leave. They die there. They never leave the place. And they let their corpses rot I guess it is some kind of sarcophagus. And then they dismember the bones. And they bring you into this crypt that's like a chapel. And it's real dark with candles all over the place. And there's one shelf with skulls and one shelf with femurs and one shelf with fibia and tibia and all kinds of bones all over the place. And the monk brings you in and he says, one day I too shall be here. <laughs> then they open the door of a little closet. It's unbelievable. Where is the skeleton of the guy who founded the place, who they call a saint? And they open it and there's this skeleton in there dressed in a green robe embroidered with gold and a hood on it. And they got all this candles and incense burning and they pray to this skeleton. They pray to death. Well, that's what became of the Desert Fathers. That is, that's what it evolved into. <laughs> the cloisterism of the Middle Ages trying to escape carnality, became more carnal than anything. You had the thing of nuns being the bride of Christ, and they, they read the Song of Solomon, not devotionally, but sexually, and things like this, saying they were the brides. It's all perverted. I don't want to talk about it now. But you look to this day. Why does Paul say forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons? In their thinking, procreation, sexuality, romance, that's something physical. Nuns are to be brides of Christ. It's a spiritual romance. You know, so. But then they're going to do this thing that, well, the priests are surrogate Christ. So you can, <laughs> convents basically became whorehouses in Italy in the, in, in, in the Middle Ages. A whorehouse with a cross on that was the convent. It goes back to the Vestal Virgins of Imperial Rome, but I, again, I digress. Well, this stuff is nuts. You look at the widespread pedophilia. Every Roman Catholic diocese in the United States, I think there was two, one in Fairbanks, Alaska, and one somewhere else, out in the middle of nowhere, where legislation is pending. In the other 177 or 179, Every single prelate, every single Roman Catholic bishop or archbishop has been found to be liable for protecting pedophile priests and, in some cases, nuns. Protecting pedophile sex criminals who use religion to, perpetu to, to, to perpetrate these crimes against children. 
and then they cover it up and they get caught. You wouldn't believe the, the spectacle they have at the, 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 the Catholic Cathedral in Los Angeles. It's unbelievable. They catch the cardinals like Law and Mahoney and these guys, but it's not just America. It's Australia. It's Britain. It's New Zealand. It's Canada. But the Catholic countries of French-speaking Africa and uh, real Catholic countries in Latin America, like Ireland, it's much worse. Much worse. You don't see real Roman Catholicism in Britain or America or Canada. To see Roman Catholicism, what it really is, you have to go to a Catholic country. We see a sanitized Islam. You don't see real Islam until you go. You know, I never saw real Mormonism until I went with David Lister to Manti, Utah. You, you don't see the real thing until you go to the real place. Well, it's like that. It was the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're all like that. Why are they doing this? Why are they molesting these kids and covering it up? Well, they had clerical celibacy. They were trying to escape that which is physical to get into that which is spiritual. Jesus wasn't married, and we're going to be a surrogate Christ, so therefore we shouldn't marry either. Wait a minute. The apostles were married, except for Paul. What, what are you talking about? In the first century, second century, third century, this was called Mancianism, Mancianism, where it became something celibate. Augustine officially renounced it, but still kept some of its tenets. In the Middle Ages, the official teaching of the Roman Church was to serve God, you had to be in their clergy. To go into the convent or monastery was something like that. You had to do that to serve God because you'd be spiritual. You'd be cut off from the physical. Okay, But the other people are breeding stock. The only good thing about marriage is having children who will be celibate. That was what they taught for centuries. And the ramifications are today. But this goes back to Colossians. Colossians is trying to destroy this philosophy of the world. Epicureans, the Stoicists, this hyper-asceticism, where you find hyper-spirituality, not only will you find pseudo-spirituality, you will find carnality. Just look at it. Look at it. Max Lucado. <laughs> who who's, who's, just got Carl in in New York a couple of months ago from the Hill song. Paula White walking with Benny Hinn on the Via Venuto in Rome and, and when he's a married man. and You see these people who are hyper-spiritual. People who are hyper-spiritual are pseudo-spiritual. They are not going to destroy carnality with asceticism. Colossians deals with that, as we'll be seeing in the forthcoming weeks. Why do you submit to these decrees? Do not do this. Do not take them. So we have a conflict in the area of knowledge. Nasos and epinasos. Nasos is the thing of the world. Epinasos is the thing of heaven. We are to look at the church from the perspective of Christ in Colossians. Now, there was a Third problem, other than Masos and this dualism. It was something that existed in other churches. At this point, there was still a large number of Jewish believers in the church. And like today, most of them were doctrinally kosher. Some of them were not. But there were non-Jews who got into Jewish legalism, trying to live under the law, trying to live under dual covenants, under two covenants. 
This is the oldest trick in the book. The Bible being the book. This is the oldest trick in the book. It's obvious, not just these hyper-messianic extremists today, but the big one, of course, the Seventh-day Adventists. We go back to Jeremiah 31, 31 always. I will make, literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And they talk Brit Ahad Shah in Bet Yehudag and Bet Israel, Lokam of a Brit in Itagdi and Mavatrim. It will be a new covenant that will not be like the one I made with their fathers. It will be different. Before Satan paganized the church with Constantine, if you read Galatians and Colossians and portions of Acts, his first trick was to try to. Judaize the church, not Jewishize it. It was already theologically a Jewish faith. Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. The one God of Israel is the God of the Jews. It was already Jewishized by nature. The natural branches were the natural branches, the root of the patriarchal covenants and promises. It was all there, not Jewishize it, Judaize it. Put it back under the law. The whole Seventh Day Adventist thing. I will never forget a pastor in upstate New York a number of years ago gave me 129 pages of evidence and testimony about what happened in Waco. I'd call it Waco, uh, Waco, on Waco, Texas, with that Branch Davidian cult and that that crazy demon possessed madman, David Koresh. I couldn't believe what was happening. They want to cut themselves up from, off from the world and be hyper-spiritual. He was the only spiritual man, so he was the only guy up in his boardwalk. The women, guys, were not allowed to sleep with their wives. They had to send their wives up to sleep with him. Widespread pedophilia. Widespread abuse of the children. And the, Oh, my good Lord, it was unbelievable. I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm reading and he would indoctrinate these people. Every day you'd have a Bible study that was exactly 13 hours long. And it was always on the same text from Revelation about a coming ap apocalyptic event. So when they shot it out with the feds, when they shot it out with the FBI, and I know J Janet Reno and the federal government completely mishandled it. But I know when it happened, they thought that this was this apocalyptic event they'd been conditioned for with this brainwashing. And I couldn't understand why people would do this with their children and with their wives and the perverted sex and all this other. And then dietary laws. He kept changing the dietary laws, what they could eat and what they couldn't. And he was into flogging and all this crazy stuff, just like just like the monasteries and convents with the flog the whole religious sadomasochism thing. And get into that. And I'm reading, and I couldn't believe that these people would follow him to their death, which they did. And what, what made them do it? And I'm reading. I got 129 pages now, and I'm just reading and reading. And it's just, this is unbelievable. About a third of his followers were from Great Britain. About 40% of his followers were Afro-American, Afro-Caribbean. They're black people, black Americans, or people from the Caribbean. And I'm trying to go, well, so what? Some are English, some American, some black, some Caucasian. What's, what, what's the common thread? Who, who would get into it? Then I, then I get to it. Then I find out where it came from. Every single one of them had been a Seventh-day Adventist, living under two covenants at the same time. The oldest trick in the book. Read Galatians. Now, I'm not denouncing voluntary observance of Jewish believers keeping their traditions and their culture in a crystal-centric way, but this stuff, these Tikkun people, which is basically the messianic branch of the NAR, 
Dan Juster and these people, Asher and Trader, they are teaching error. It's very dangerous. But Seventh-day Adventism has always been doing this kind of stuff. Well, so we get to the third. Judaization. It seems to be compatible. So you got these Gentile people. Well, we're Christians and we believe in Jesus and Jesus was Jewish and the scriptures were written by Jews and the God of Israel is the one true God and therefore, so what are they? <laughs> they don't just acculturate. They go under the law, but it seems to make some kind of sense to them. Are we getting a transmission? Yes. Okay. Let's continue. The Gnostic separated matter from thought, obviously. Matter was evil. Thought or knowledge was necessary to be saved. That was their thinking. So from this would come another heresy. Docetism. Docetism. Docetism says that Jesus only appeared to be human. He was not really human. If he walked on the sand, he would not leave footprints. He only seemed to be. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses are two things. They are Latter-day Aryans. They believe that Jesus is an angelic being, specifically Michael. They believe what the Aryans believe, that he's an angel who became human. But the second thing, they are docetists, docetic. They think the resurrection was only apparent to be physical. It was an apparent physical event. It wasn't a literal physical event. His body was somehow spiritual even though it appeared to be human. Where did the Jehovah's Witnesses get this stuff? Well, they got it from what Colossians warned about. And they're not the only ones, but they're the primary example most of us would have, have encountered. Well, let's go further with this. These philosophies begin getting into the church. And two divergent directions exist. You have those who are Christocentric and those who get taken in by the philosophies of the world. But among those who get taken in by the philosophies of the world and the worldview of the world and the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age of the world, and the world's perspective of knowledge. You have the Epicureans in Athens and the Stoics or the aesthetics, and you have the carnal. This was an even bigger problem in Corinth. In Colossae, Paul is warning about it. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with it. Now, this is more of a subject for 1 Corinthians. He's dealing with it. Only the new creation matters, not the old one. I can go out and I can go out and I can sleep around and fornicate and I can, you know, I can get inebriated and I can do this and I can do the other thing. That's only the flesh. It's it doesn't matter. I'm spiritual, I'm a new creation. The new creation can't sin. So it becomes a license to sin, this dualism. There was this radio preacher in New York, and I have no reservation about naming him. A lot of people listen to him. It was Wayne Mamblo. Wayne Mamblo. And he always talked about grace and preached about grace, 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 grace. Last count, he was married four times, divorced and married remarried four times. Adulterous marriages by the standards of Christ. Adulterous. Oh, grace. Grace. 
Yeah. Grace. The grace of God is designed to bring us to repentance. It is not designed to bring us into a permit to sin. I'll give you two examples. One is Chris Rollsboro in America. Both of his children are divorced and remarried from other Christians. But the Lutherans emphasize grace. <laughs> Wait a minute. The grace that Luther taught about was salvation by grace as opposed to sacramental regeneration. Luther taught against the Roman Catholic ex opere operato ritualism as a vehicle for salvation. That's what he meant by grace. Grace, 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 grace. You can get divorced and remarried. And the son is out there with four-letter words and sexually connotated vulgarity on his blog. And, and, and he runs the guy's media ministry, pirate radio. Four-letter filth in the public domain. Oh, it's all grace. This, this is Chris Rosebro. Very sad and shocking. But it happens. Don't you believe in grace? Yeah, the grace of God is designed to bring us to repentance. Another one, a big one today, is from Singapore. Very thing that Colossians warned about. What happens when you get into this thing of this kind of dualistic division in your thinking and you rewrite scriptural doctrinal theology based on it, you wind up with not the Stoicism, but the Epicureanism called licentiousness. Licentiousness. It becomes a license. You have people who believe this. He is the Asian counterpart of the American Joel Austin. His name is Joseph Prince. He is the apostle of licentiousness. He perverts the scriptures unbelievably. Unbelievably. We only have to repent once. The man teaches licentiousness. He has a false view of salvation and a false view of the Christian life, but it's popular. It gets into the church. Today, we have places and states in America and elsewhere where you have no fault car insurance. Doesn't matter if it's a drunk driver. Or you have no fault divorce. There's no blame. We're not here to apportion blame. We're not here to burden people with guilt. And they call this grace when it gets in the church. <laughs> They're taking the same mentality. The marriage failed. It was nobody's fault. I was a cocaine freak in my youth. I understand addiction. Uh, I had alcoholics in my family. Uh, my friends were drug addicts. I understand addiction. I understand it. I was in it. I don't just understand it objectively. I understand it subjectively. But I also understand what it's like to meet Jesus and be set free from it. Okay. But you can see this thing today. I'm a victim of a disease. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> As if they have polio or diphtheria. They're the victim of a disease. And then when they fall off the wagon and go out and get drunk, I had a relapse. <laughs> this is what the world is teaching. They're destroying any kind of a moral base for personal responsibility based on this ancient dualistic thinking. All comes from what Paul warned about. Once the influences of, of the Judeo-Christian faith stop influencing a society, a nation, and its values, you're always going to go back to what you read about in the Greco-Roman world. People will always revert to that stuff. 
we have teachings on Romans where we talk about how the world now is culturally very much like the world that Paul addressed in, in Romans, where violence was entertainment and all this kind of stuff. Homosexuality was seen as normative. Again, separate teaching, but like that. Well, no fault divorce, no fault insurance. Oh, I'm an alcoholic, but I had a relapse. I'm a victim of a disease. Yeah, when I was strung out, and I was pretty strung out, and we have other people in Moriel who, who were saved out of drug addiction. I'm not the only one. Uh, when I was, I had what the world called a drug problem. No, I had a sin problem. <laughs> the drug problem was the result of the sin. I had a sin problem. That's what I had. Uh, It's not my fault. There's no blame. There's no guilt. This gets into the church today. Seeker sensitive, seeker friendly. We don't talk about judgment or guilt or blame. There's one recording. I only met the guy once. I knew people who knew him. I know some of his family in New Zealand, but I did one conference with him in England some years ago. And he did this teaching, and I think it's a booklet, Hell's Best Kept Secret by Ray Comfort. Nice Jewish boy from, from Christ Church, New Zealand. I wish every Christian, if you haven't heard that tape or read, read, read the booklet, I wish you would do so. <laughs> Hell's best kept secret. Don't preach grace until you preach law. Unless people know they're condemned, they won't know why they need to be saved. Hell's best kept secret by Ray Comfort. Well worth listening to. Probably get it online. Well, in the world, though, with the present zeitgeist, with the present spirit of the age, we don't talk about guilt or blame. We're not here to apportion blame. In other words, we sweep everything under the rug in terms of personal culpability, unless there's a political motive to amplify it. <laughs> then, it's into the church. We don't want to preach law. We want to preach grace. We just want to love. We don't want to judge. Jesus was judged in our place on the cross. We don't have to judge. Doesn't that sound scriptural? Yeah, Jesus was judged on the cross in our place. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says we have to judge the church. And in 1 Corinthians 11, before we take the Lord's Supper, we have to judge ourselves. Oh, we don't want to judge. You better judge. But the church will be destroyed, and so will your personal relationship with the Lord be at least damaged. But it gets in. The philosophies of the world get into the church. Now again, Colossians is not focused on the philosophies themselves. It's focused on preventing them, explaining how they got into the church, and then makes it obvious what we should do to rectify the mess when it does happen. If you hold to what the Lord tells us through Paul, and he opens it beautifully in chapter 1, if you hold to what Paul told us and what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write in Colossians, if we listen to that book, a lot of the mess we're in now wouldn't be happening a lot of the messes that have happened, even in our own lifetime and throughout the history of the church, never would have happened. Never. And a lot of things that are going to happen never would have happened. Don't forget the things that Paul saw were going to happen with the shipwreck in Acts 28. 
They didn't have to happen. He predicted they would happen. He prophesied they would happen, but they didn't have to. If they took his warning, it wouldn't have happened. It was a conditional prophecy like with, like with Jonah. Well, if we don't get back to understanding the message of Colossians, the church is in big trouble. In fact, it's in big trouble already for that reason. But this is a book we really need to understand. Lord willing, we will continue next week at this time looking at the subject. Hopefully, we'll have the technical specs worked out so it will also be viewable on RTN uh, live stream simultaneously. But I thank you so much for joining us this week. I've gone on long enough. This is the introduction. Next week, we begin with an exegesis, verse by verse, of chapter one. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jacob. Really appreciate that <clears throat> great teaching. Um, I haven't got a lot of questions yet. I did get one that was just, and you kind of covered this to a certain degree, but who are some of the new people who are teaching this word of faith uh, stuff? Well, obviously the classics came from Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, people like that, the, the, the Jerry Seville and John Avanzini, the word faith money preachers, the televangelists. And there's another generation of them. Then came Creflo Dollar and these other people. But that, it's them. Yeah, it's a them. lot of them are their, their children and stuff. And oh, yeah. I, but Mar Morris Cirillo has a son. Yeah, exactly. These things tend to be family enterprises. And you were, uh, of course, you mentioned Joseph Prince. That's an important one. And Paula White, you know, and Steve Furtick over here in North Carolina. Steve Furtick is a very dangerous man. Even more dangerous than him is Andy Stanley. Yes. But we'll be mentioning these people perhaps a bit next week, or the week after. Right. That's good. Um, let's see. Who said they had a question here? Um, of course, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about people from, there's a whole host of people from Bethel that are under that category. Let's see. Uh, Mika has one there. Uh, trying to get Mika's uh, microphone on here. Okay. Yeah, I should have looked for it. If you've got a question, you've got sure. a little button down there that says raise your hand. If you put it up, it'll pop up next to Sandy. All right. Thanks. If you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Well, I have this kind of a friend or friend family, and uh, they have been Christians, but they have going this kind of a Messianic uh, Jew direction. And they are, they are keeping the law, and uh, and I'm a little bit concerned where they are going going for because it's it's seems to be more Judaism than it's uh, it's a Christianity anymore. That it's uh, uh, I was thinking that how can I talk to them? How can I you know? Is there should I be a concerned really, or well, you know? And, okay, let me answer your question. Paul says he became as all things to all people in 1 Corinthians 9. As an evangelistic strategy, he acculturated to the people he was trying to reach. To the slaves, he became a slave. To the free men and free men, to those who are under the Torah, the law, as one who was under the law. And we see in Acts uh, chapter 20, and he takes the vow of the Nazarite and so forth. There is nothing wrong with Jewish believers keeping their Jewish culture and religious observances for reasons of culture, testimony, and evangelistic strategy to evangelize other Jews. But when you say it is necessary for salvation or necessary for discipleship and then put it on other people, and then put it on people who are not even Jewish or married to Jews. That is wrong. That is neo-Galatianism. Mm -hmm. It is completely unscriptural. The main scriptural passage that addresses that problem is also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Can we turn to it, please, in response? To Are you the opera singer in Finland or somewhere? 
Yeah, Finland, yeah, yeah, I'm in Tewa in Finland. You're the, you're the funicul, you funicul, ah, yeah, 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 this guy's a professional opera singer. <laughs> Let's look at First Corinthians chapter 7. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's, let's look at verse 17. Only 17. as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in that matter, let him walk unless I direct. Verse 18. Was any man called already circumcised? In other words, he was a Jew. Okay, or a convert, a proselyte to Judaism. Could be either one. Has anyone been called? Uh, let him not become uncircumcised. If you don't give up your Jewish identity, you see that in verse yeah. seven, verse eighteen. Yeah. And it says, "Has anyone been called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Don't go under the law." Now it's not talking about some people want circumcision for medical reasons. That's a different issue, but it means in a religious sense of, of going under the law. Okay, let each man, the circumcision is nothing in verse 19, uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Let each man remain in the state in which he was called. Okay, stay as you are. Don't abandon your own culture. Now, I have to qualify this. When Hudson Taylor went to China, he followed Paul in 1 Corinthians 9. He dressed like a Chinese person. He ate rice with chopsticks <laughs> like a Chinese person. <laughs> he, learned, he learned to speak Chinese. He eventually married a Chinese believer. Okay, He culturally became Chinese for the sake of the gospel. He acculturated... My wife and children are Israeli Jews. You know, I have no Jewish background or upbringing at all, none, except that I went to the Jewish community center as a kid. I was in the Jewish community, but not the Jewish religion. My wife and children are different, okay? We always had Purim, you know, and Hanukkah and Passover, but in a Christocentric way. Jesus is the light of the world at Hanukkah. You know, Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. The Pas That's fine. And it was a way, it's a way to evangelize Jewish people, invite them to a Seder and show how Jesus fulfills the Passover. It's, there's no problem with that. But as soon as you ma make it mandatory or say it's necessary for salvation or necessary for discipleship or there's an inherent holiness in it, and then putting other people in bondage, especially people when it's not their culture. That's not the same as being a missionary or, of course, marrying into that culture. But just what, what you, you described, it is wrong. Show them 1 Corinthians chapter 7. That's the best passage I know of in the New yes. Testament. Okay. Another question, please. Sandy, we have any more questions? Yes, Joanne. Hi. Joanne has a question. Go ahead. Hi, I was wondering about, um, like, when did the church start worshiping mainly on Sunday, and what the Bible says about that? And you know, I'm kind of confused about that area. Well, we have teachings dealing with that about Sabbatarianism. It's not really tonight's subject, but I will answer it in brief. In the first century, we know that in Revelation 1, by the end of the first century, John was in the spirit on the Lord's Day, not the Sabbath, not, not Shabbat. Jewish believers continued to worship on Saturday, but diasporic Jewish believers worshipped on both Saturday and Sunday. They, they kept both, in a lot of cases at least, okay? But right from the beginning, because of the resurrection, from a very early point, Christians worshipped on a Sunday. 
in the first century. It was not a later development as the Seventh Day Adventists try to claim. It was Sunday worship was around, but remember, our our Sabbath is not in a day; it's in a person. And we'll look at that when we get to chapter two in Colossians. So come back next week and the week after, and we'll get there. Amen to that. Um, Deborah also had a question. If you got time, Deborah. Hi, I thought you were going to ask that question for me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Andy, that's okay. I got to scroll back up to find my where I put my notes. I couldn't consolidate them all, so you go ahead and ask a, one question. Okay. Well, basically, maybe it's a statement, but I, I just really feel that we have a responsibility in allowing our spiritual environments to get to the point that it is right now. And, you know, in terms of contending for the faith, you know, it's almost as if these individuals go unchallenged, you know, in a corporate setting or, you know, in, in the church. And, you know, we know that everything must be done in decency and order. But at what point, you know, do we take some responsibility? Those of us that know the truth, okay, that, you forward. know, we, we do nothing. When we do nothing. to go off. When people begin to go off in a congregation, in God's ideal order, it should first of all be the leadership of the congregation who addresses it. It should be the leadership of the congregation that takes the responsibility. The best way to do it, at least initially, is with right teaching. Don't target a person, target an issue. If it's possible to target the issue, let the Holy Spirit show them it applies to them. Try to target the issue instead of the person. Don't go address a person and things like this, you know, if, if you don't have to. It's better to address the issue instead of the person. Uh, we have one more question before we're probably going to have to uh, go off live stream. Uh, Darren, did you have a question? Oh, uh, Hey, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um a ch Jacob. cheeky question. How you doing, Jacob? Hope you're well, mate. Hello. Um, there's a, a guy, a messianic guy who's doing some teaching and preaching. And I just don't know whether you've heard of him. Jim Stately. Does that ring a bell? Jim Stately? Um, he's um, apparently, I don't know. I, I did some research on him, but um, I just wondered if you if you heard of him and heard of his ministry. I knew of a guy, Jim Staley, a number of years ago. Yes. And he, he was not Jewish, but he was an evangelist to the Jews, Jim Staley. I knew oh, him a number of years ago, but I don't remember him well. But I don't know if that's the same person you're talking it about. Be, uh, it might, might be the one. He's just, um, I don't know, the, yeah, my, a brother in law was um, pointing him out to us. He's quite into his teaching, I think. But um, I just I didn't know there's lots of things going around on the internet. But um, one of the things was saying, like, um, he's quite a big ministry, like I think, like you say, to the Jews. But um, he had. Um, he had um, got involved with some kind of money thing or something, and uh, his congregation have thrown him out, and he now has this separate ministry type thing. I just, I don't know, he's, uh, he's quite prominent, but Jim Stanley. I don't know if it's the same guy that I knew years ago, yeah. and, and I haven't ah. seen him in years. Yeah. Don't know. All right. Okay, we have time for one more question, Sandy, or not? Um. Let's see who's got one here. It must be about tonight's subject. Otherwise, yeah, that would help. Eric, uh, let me try to get here. Uh, unmute you. Go ahead, Eric. All right. Thank you, Jacob, for the teaching. In, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you had just mentioned about the circumcision and uh, uncircumcision. We know that that's Jew and Gentile. But when we talk to Sabbath keepers, which I think that doctrine is coming back very, very strongly now, um, many people are going into that delusion. Um, it says, but keeping the commandments of God, of God is what matters. So when you talk to a Sabbath keeper, they say, you see, you got to keep the commandments. Okay, but when we get to chapter 2, verses 16 to 19, we'll be addressing that very issue. This epistle speaks to that very issue so does Romans 14 in a related way. But centrally, Colossians 2 deals with that. Tonight, I was just laying the foundation for Colossians. Next week, we'll begin going through verse by verse. And when we get to chapter 2, we will tackle this very, very issue. 
Great. All right. We're looking forward to that. And uh, I hope all of you can join us next week. Uh, same time, same station. And uh, looking forward to his continued teaching in Colossians. Thank you, Jacob, so much. And Thank you all for joining us. I hope it was profitable to you and the Lord. Yeah. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.